I'm speaking to you today from Ashore, uh, which is the FAA Center of Excellence. We also have Ashore Research and Development Corp, which is another business entity that takes advantage of all the same industry partners and universities to support industry, other governments, things like that. Um, we've heard a lot already today about just the amazing things UAS can do. In you know, low margin business, uh, high volume, low margin, you need to build efficiencies. Really with UAS and automation, we've heard that all week long, is you're, you're, you're fighting on the, art, um, the margins. UAS, really any mission that is dull, dirty, or dangerous, and then also we use distance or difficult to get to, hard access type in, um, situations, uh, those, are outstanding applications. Uh, for example, you know, imagine the dude who's hanging from a harness inspecting that bridge or going up in the power lines, you know, 50 plus pilots every single year doing um, power line inspections die. We don't really need to do that. UAS with change, man, you know, change systems, detection systems, uh, those things with the right uh, uh, payload on it can do much, much more than what a pilot is trying to do as he flies and inspects these power lines as they go down the power lines. Uh, medical industry uh, down here are life serving, uh, firefighting, uh, tremendous capabilities with IR sensors uh, that can be done. And then in pure firefighting, laying in some technologies have been developed now to do backfires off of UAVs, to backburn areas that the, uh, the firefighters can't get to yet. Um, uh, we've already talked about some of this. Linear infrastructure, oil and gas, I think we have a lot of oil and gas here, rail, electrical lines, that's uh, amazing. Uh, of course, law enforcement is another big one. We see the real estate. And then when you're just kind of bored, you need that pizza on, uh, on Sunday for all your friends, you can get the uh, pizza delivery service, which have, actually I think it was Australia, they tried to give that a try. But, you know, we're also rotten. I'm gonna talk through a little bit today some of the challenges and how we're overcoming it in the research. Uh, the National, uh, National Air Airspace System is, a, is an amazing asset that we have here in this country. And the FAA has worked very, very hard to keep that thing safe and provide access to that, but they, they're very, very careful to defend it. Uh, we have interference, so we do not want this situation to occur, you know, where we have contact between two flying vehicles. Uh, got, of course, people just not, cons you know, concerned about it, got privacy issues, and, uh, and then also just interference with uh, current operations. Is, is that UAV, that vehicle that's flying here, part of the team or interfering? How do we do get news on top of the firefighters and all that is, uh, is being currently researched and worked on. Now, I like to talk about, because people usually bring up to me, and I'm not the FAA, I'm, I support them, um, what I see or why is it moving so slow? And then I'll say, you're an industry guy. And then I'll get from the government side, you know, why don't these people understand the, you know, how complicated this is? Well, you're an industry person that's used to solving problems and dealing with them rapidly, you know, we'll just catch that next problem as we deal with it. What we have basically is a clash of cultures. And in that, on the regulatory side, they're just mainly responsible for safety. So take, let's take this in terms of reality. You know, how many flew in here today, I mean, for this event? Okay, most of you. Uh, okay, out of, out of that, uh-oh, he's got it in the back. Um, if, God forbid, a Airbus 320 or a 737 were to crash tomorrow, who would not get on their airplane and fly home tomorrow? There's no hands raised. Because we have confidence, we, the FAA has built a public trust that we know even, first of all, it's highly unlikely that we're gonna have a problem. But if we do have a problem, it's gonna be properly investigated, people are gonna be held accountable, liable, and any adjustments that need to be made will be made, right? But take, for example, if we had a UAV crash into a schoolyard with those blades slice up some kids' bloody pictures on the, um, on the evening news, 
Now, what's the likelihood that the UAV uh, industry is going to be set back and rules stopped? That public trust has not been built yet. And the utility of UAS has not been built yet. So the FAA is very methodical and they're very, very data driven to make sure that everything will look and, and operate safely. Industry, on the other hand, <clears throat> is responsible for a good return on investment and they are very technology driven. They're also data driven, but they move very, very quickly in how they are first to market. This creates that conflict that we see. And overall, though, who determines uh, who wins this is, is the public and the public trust. So how basically how a shore works and in the past, industry would go to the FAA and say, hey, I got this great idea I want to do with the UAV. What do I need to do to, to be able to do this? And the FAA said to them, you can't do it. And they said, well, what do I need to do to make that happen? And they would turn back to the industry partner and say, you tell me, you tell me what's safe. Because they don't, they're not inherently research uh, an agency. They don't have the answers yet. So what was done is the creation of Assure allows industry to pass through Assure their concept of operations, usually protected by various non-disclosure agreements, that talks about their technology, their method of operations, and we use their expertise and resources with all our researchers to determine risk. We talked about risk earlier and how to mitigate risk, what's safe, what's not safe. And we, based on that third party research, we provide that information based on usually people type uh, regulations. That's like training and qualifications that have been talked about, systems, certifications of the type of air aircraft, and then ultimately what type of operation. Is that operation safe? We pass that data to the FAA. We usually provide them with it, it <clears throat> recommendations but the FAA does what the FAA does and does whatever it wants to do. Based on that, what FAA then does in return is it provides industry that access to the NAS, the National Airspace, uh, in the form of regulations, guidelines, and standards. So that's kind of our role. This is only one path, because usually nowadays we're getting from the FAA, they are finally getting out in front. They're about three to five years ahead now in their regulatory scheme of what they want to do. And they're telling us what to research and we're finding the industry partners to partner with us to get that research accomplished. What is Assure? We are 23 universities, uh, primarily focused on um, applied research. You do not see the MITs, the Caltechs, because they're much more theoretical and very much uh, focused on actually applying research so that we can get regulations out and industry into the air. Um, they either, these universities either already had applications uh, working with the FAA or they're very aviation uh, specific and then in some cases we had to go to schools for things like specialty and human factors and training and such, so that's the schools. But we can't do it without our industry partners. We have over 100 industry partners around the world that really bring the expertise, the ideas uh, to, to make things happen. An example of the outcome of one of our research projects, and I'll go through our projects real quickly, is when Part 107 came out, it said that you can, with certain conditions, be allowed to fly a UAV less than 55 pounds daytime within line of sight, not over people. Well, what we then did with the FAA's help, or actually even testing the FAA, is we went out to figure out, okay, the next step where the FAA is going is flights over people. We know that. So how would we work the waiver process for that. So uh, in this case, Alabama Huntsville went out using its, and I'll talk about some of the projects that are ongoing, using its research uh, that looked at what happens when a UAV hits a person. What are the results? What happens when they hit a head, the chest, the propellers, all that. They used their, their research to, to attempt to get a waiver with the FAA. We found a lot of issues within the FAA on this. They self-discovered things, and uh, as they worked through the process, they actually came up with a waiver, but that waiver uh, within the, that the FAA presented <coughs> only allowed 
uh, them to fly a UAV 10 feet over people's heads uh, because of fear of energy as the thing fell out of the sky. So there's more work to be done. Uh, last week I was there at the FAA as they had a murder board with this group of folks who have done the research uh, to validate and question every bit of research that they did on hitting people. So the FAA is very concerned that we get it right because what that will allow is actually an increase in the weight of vehicle for the amount of safety and, and maintaining the same level of safety. Getting away from a methodology that the FAA had used for well over 50 years based on uh, projectiles, missiles, uh, space junk, um, falling from the sky and, and that's, that's the methodology that they use. And anybody who picks up a UAV knows they're usually plastic, they're flexible versus the fragments, the metal fragments falling from space or from high altitude. So a uh, little bit of different, uh, different tack. Just to run through some of our research projects uh, that we have going on uh, with the part 107, the first one was small UAS certification. Obviously, we don't want to take that little DJI Phantom and have to have the same standardization requirements as we would for a 747. So they went through the process to look at what those are and then things like data links and such went forward. No certification is required under Part 107 except the pilot to say it's safe for flight. But any of these waivers for flight over people, nighttime operations, this group built the actual the framework for what that certification will look like in the future, which may turn into, we'll see how it goes as, as industry comes to us with ideas, type certifications for like oil and gas, oil platform inspections or bridge inspections and things like that. Is it so different that we need a type certification? That'll set that up. DAA is detect and avoid for beyond visual line of sights operations. Basically, any of our industry partners tell us they need to be able to operate within uh, outside a line, normal line of sight. So that group right now is in this early stages. They're looking at radio line of sight uh, interference patterns uh, so that we can establish data link in the bands that are going to be allocated to uh, for use uh, for UAS. Uh, they are moving on to different detect and avoid, LIDAR, air, grounds, and then the whole scheme of what, is, how do we define risk with those. The next stages will actually be testing different var uh, variations and configurations to establish the safety level. Three and four are huge visibility, air to air collisions and air to ground collisions where we took UA UAVs, both fixed wing and quadcopters and ran them against uh, a 737 and a Learjet in modeling. And then also against people on the ground, obviously we didn't use real students. We used modeling and dummies, the task uh, crash test dummies uh, to determine what happens when it hits a person. Uh, we have outbriefed that to the FAA. We're waiting for their response for public release. Uh, so I won't be able to get into huge details on that today but very, very interesting studies. The engine studies are following, they're ongoing right now of what happens when it gets stuck down a turbofan. Uh, will, it, will the turbofan maintain everything inside as, it, as like when a bird hits it and takes out flan blades, will it uh, secure those fan blades? Uh, maintenance, modification, and repair, that's a big one. Again, is it based on size? Is it based on mission? If it's flying over an uh, agricultural field, are we so worried about the maintenance on that aircraft? versus flying over people. So that is really a, a key one that is ongoing right now, and it will probably help define how the FAA categorizes drones in the future in different uses. Detect and avoid systems. It took current systems like TCAS and radar and looked at each one of those in criticality of how important they are for, to the FAA today to maintain safe separation between aircraft. We found some, uh, again, these results are not public yet, but we found some very interesting uh, things uh, in the FAA system as we went through that weren't working quite like the FAA thought they were working. Um, and they're, they're gonna probably make some adjustments based on that. Human factors, uh, for the first time since the 1920s, we're looking at is the cross check and the way man integrates with these things the same as the cockpit of the past where we had the T cross check for any instrument pilots. They know that you, you can fly in clouds if you have this basic instrument pattern. 
They went back to look at what machines do better, what man does better, and they're based on that, they're gonna roll it into one of the other ones is the control system design standards of, of the future. So it may not look exactly like a cockpit of the past because man, does man really need to do certain functions where the machine can do it much, much better than we can. We did some initial noise study work just to get an idea, uh, categorize baseline how these things are. And although they're not as loud as jet airplanes, many times they're more irritating. They sound like a lawnmower flying around your house. So they've captured some of that and the FAA will turn back to that when it becomes more important. Uh, part 107 I've already talked about. We're in the process of doing some counter UAS work, that detection of small UAS near airports becomes very, very critical so that the, air, the airfield managers themselves, when they, when they detect one of these things, how do they know if it's friend or foe? And then how will they adjust air traffic to the situation can be made safe? Uh, that's the purpose of that one. 13 is STEM. Uh, this thing has got kids fired up from uh, elementary school through college. Uh, we're using UAS uh, as a team to go out to schools and use it for uh, science, technology, and engineering and math development. Just some quick thoughts and challenges. Uh, the regulatory risk, you heard about that today. That is really uh, kind of slowing things down. That's where we are primarily focused, uh, as I've discussed. Technology risk. We're in a rapid change of technology. Um, Todd mentioned this a little bit. Uh, with the rapid change of technology, with the speed of how things change, is it really worth going out and buying a system or renting it or buying a service and letting them develop it? Uh, and then in the end, you know, after we move out of the 1920s and 40s and we get to today where we know what a most, all the airplanes that kind of come off the line, all the efficiencies and design have been built, then you don't have to change it as much. Um, that's kind of the operational structures and costs. Do you build an internal program? Maybe if you're Exxon Mobil, you do that, but, or do you hire a services company to conduct your business? Um, basically seizing the opportunities, uh, boy, UAS can be so much cheaper. When you compare it to a helicopter that costs about 2,000 a flight hour and a UAS cost, you know, at most for the system itself, uh, maybe maybe two thousand dollars in the training it's faster and more efficient in many many cases there's still applications for man flight but there's plenty that uas can take on hardware you can look at these system as basically the trucks that carry the sensors uh, there's that kind of design in the quadcopters or the fixed wing and those will evolve a little bit but i don't think a whole lot but the sensors are key because the sensors lead to the next thing and Todd said this, it's all about the data. This is where the money's to be made. Both the metadata, the planning data, the onboard systems, uh, predictive analysis, uh, difference, uh, change analysis, all of that is key. And then do you, do you process that data onboard or do you offboard it? What are the communication systems to do that? There is just so much to be done in this area of uh, of the data. And with that, I think we'll turn it back over to Rick to run the panel.